Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This week's episode is titled Throwback Thursday, a competing creation narrative. And this is a new series that I've decided to begin on the podcast and that I've called Throwback Thursday. And the intention of this series, which again will be sprinkled throughout the podcast in various weeks, is to highlight some of the Uh, best episodes throughout Unbinding the Bible. Now, by best, I simply mean those whose themes that I discuss on those particular episodes I find to be incredibly important to understand if we want to be faithful interpreters of the Bible and or recognize ways in which some of the themes that I'm bringing up really do have incredibly relevant application to modern day issues that Christians need to be prepared to face. These episodes might also be those that I've received the most discussion and the most feedback from by listeners like you. And so I invite you, um, as you listen to this first episode, I also invite you if if one particular episode stood out to you, an interview with an author or something from the book of Revelation or an insight early on in the podcast from the opening chapters of Genesis, um, let me know. And it very well may find its way onto a throwback Thursday in the future. And that will be owed entirely to you. So don't be shy about that. I'm very excited about Throwback Thursdays. Um, This gives me an opportunity on particularly busy weeks to pull an episode up. But I also realize now that we've been doing this for over three years, there's a lot of material in the past that is still foundational for my own understanding. And yet if you've joined the podcast anytime along its journey, you may not have gone back and listened to every episode. And so on Throwback Thursdays, I will not be putting these in any particular order, but I simply wanted to um, insert episodes that I felt were challenging. And to be honest with you, some of the episodes I'm going to choose are ones that were particularly powerful to me. So in the study of my own preparation for the podcast, there are weeks where I am visibly and noticeably affected by the messages that I'm bringing to you because I learned quite a bit as I prepared each and every one of these episodes. And so the episode that you're going to listen to here is all the way back to number four. I believe this was published in October of 2018. So this is a long way back and I will explain the episode. I have simply pulled it straight out of its file and inserted it back in here. And so you will hear the same shaky tenor of my voice or the same um, approach that I had at the very beginning. I've kind of developed my my time as I've gone and gotten a little more comfortable with you as the listener and in my own speaking, but I want you to experience it as you may have experienced it in real time if you were one of the first listeners um, on the podcast when it was first released. I go into plenty of detail in explaining what this competing creation narrative is, But one of the reasons why I find this so valuable, as I will actually share on the episode, is because I still think that while many Christians today hold to a Genesis 1 understanding of the creation narrative, just to state that we believe that isn't as important as it actually is to be gripped by the realities that it is communicating when we say we believe it. Because there were, in fact, creation myths origin stories is all I mean by the word myth, an origin story that has actually captured the hearts and the imaginations of Christians more, in my opinion, than the actual Genesis 1 narrative. And so by bringing this Babylonian creation myth to the forefront, it gives you and it gives me the opportunity to imagine how Genesis is written to counteract that and how as faithful followers of Jesus and as lovers of the word, we are able to reposition ourselves to truly embrace the way Genesis describes creation and not the way the Babylonians used to celebrate it. And so I'm encouraged. Um, I got lots of discussion from this episode, um, sometimes from people that I heard nothing else from any other episode. And so I thought this would be a great one to launch Throwback Thursdays with. I think you're gonna like it. I'm excited that you're tuning in. Feel free to share this with a friend if you think they could be encouraged by it. And as I said, in the weeks and months to come, look 
for um, randomly tossed in Throwback Thursdays where we will revisit an episode somewhere in the podcast that I think is significant for our time. So with all that, I leave you with the first Throwback Thursday. Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is week four of our podcast while we are working through just the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. And from chapter one, which was our third week podcast, we just kind of walked through a little bit about Genesis one, looking at how God takes what is unformed and uninhabited and he forms certain parts of the creation to bring order to them and structure so that he can then fill them or inhabit them with the parts of that creation that are best suited to occupy that location. And we looked at how on day one God creates the light and then on day four he puts things in place to inhabit that space and to rule over the day and the night and then day two um, and day five day three with day six and and so on and one thing that i brought up as i was sharing that particular viewpoint was the fact that many times um, christians sometimes non-christians have some of their own ideas in mind when they come to a passage like genesis 1 and without meaning to or or maybe they do mean to but Um, sometimes it's very unconscious, is that we read a passage of Scripture and try to make sense of it as it relates to our own context. And this is not only understandable, but it's totally normal that we would do this. And yet, with the Bible, it's very important for us to remember that these passages were written in a particular context to a particular people at a time when there were other ideas about how the world began and the the way that those ideas actually helped shape um, the way people chose to live their lives. And the Bible is, is powerful in that it is able to speak to a people in their own time, in their own context, and it doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't speak to us at our own time, in our own context. It just means that when the Bible speaks to its particular context, the more we can learn about that time and about those circumstances, the more equipped we are to really receive the Bible's overall message, both for that time as well as for our own. And so today, I wanted to point out a particular myth, if you will, a story, a narrative, a competing creation narrative that was viewed by many of the cultures surrounding Israel and had actually, and we will see as we read through the Old Testament, found its way into being believed by the Israelites themselves. Um, It's a particular way of understanding the world that ultimately originated with Babylon who, if you know from the Tower of Babel story in Genesis 11, on through the very nation that is responsible for bringing Judah into exile and destroying the Jerusalem temple, Babylon is also used as the code for Roman oppression in the book of Revelation to describe the kinds of worldly empires that are opposed to God and his ways. And because that's the case, they also, Babylon also, the worldly kingdoms of this world also have an idea about the way the world came into being that directly affects the way they look at the world, how they treat the people in the world, how they look at societies and societal structures in the world, how they think about what it means to rule, how they think um, about what it means to be made in the image of of whatever kind of God or gods they believe are responsible for their creation. And this is all this is all really relatively simple. But what I find quite amazing is that I grew, grew up most of my life never ever even hearing about the particular narratives that were believed by some of these other people groups. And the reason I didn't, or maybe I heard that such things existed, but I just chose to ignore them, under the heading of, well, we know that other gods aren't real. 
we know that they're just figments of people's imaginations. So these old ancient stories don't really do anything for us because we know that they aren't real. Now, that might be in some sense true. It might be untrue in another sense. But it's a really naive view to believe that because we claim that the gods of the nations aren't real, therefore it's not worth our time to understand where they are coming from and how they view the world is not only naive, but it's extremely irresponsible. Because what it fails to do is it fails to put ourselves in the actual position of real people, particularly the Israelites, whose entire culture being surrounded by these pagan nations and, and kingdoms had communicated their own views of the way the world worked and Israel got sucked right in. And unbeknownst to Israel began to imagine that the way their God worked was in subtle ways similar to the way these other gods worked. And one of the things that the Bible repeats over and over and over, particularly in the book of Isaiah, is God saying to his people, I am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no other. Who will you compare me with? What am I like? What in the creation will you look at to compare me with? And again, we read these stories and we say, yes, there's nothing. God alone is the creator. And that is true. But there are underlying things about God as creator that aren't always as clear as you and I like to think. There are certain attributes of God that people are drawn to based upon the things that they think they need at a particular moment and what they think the motives are. God had were um, when he created the world. And so what I would like to do in this episode is to simply share with you the Babylonian creation myth, the Babylonian creation narrative, the story believed by many of the Babylonians and the story that was declared to the entire world as to where everything that you and I see actually came from, but more importantly, how it came about. And so what I would like to do is to tell you the Babylonian creation myth, a competing creation narrative. And again, the main reason I would like to do so is because how you and I think God created the world and um, placed himself as ruler over it and the reasons he's chosen to do so will directly affect how you believe you and I are called to image this God when we create, when we rule, when we cause the creation to flourish. So one of the things being made in the image of God means is that who we think God is and how we think God acts directly affects who we think we are and how we think we act. There is a direct relationship always between the two. And so it is absolutely crucial that you and I get to understand some things about who God actually is and how he chooses to create and why he does it the way that he does it so that we can better understand the way we are supposed to rule over the creation as his image bearers. And so here is the story in a nutshell. In the beginning, according to this Babylonian myth, Apsu, the father god, and Tiamat, the mother god, give birth to all the gods. The younger gods that they give birth to make a bunch of racket. Um, kind of sounds like most of modern families' little children, but they make a bunch of noise, and the older gods, they resolve to get rid of the younger gods so that the older gods can get some, some sleep, can get some peace and quiet. Well, the younger gods uncover the plot before the older gods put it into action, and they kill Apsu, the father god. His wife, Tiamat, the mother god, 
who is also known as the Dragon of Chaos, plots her revenge against the younger gods for killing her husband. Now these younger gods are terrified by Tiamat, this dragon of chaos, and they don't know what to do about her coming rage and wrath. And so these rebel gods, they turn for salvation to their youngest member, Marduk. And he negotiates a steep price for these other gods. If he can step in and do something to ward off Tiamat's wrath, then they must give him all of the... uh, all of their power as they gather together in the assembly of the gods. He's got to be made chief and an undisputed ruler holder in the assembly of, of all of their gods. And so he, they grant him this promise. They say, sure, whatever you want, you just need to protect us from this, this goddess who is, is out to kill us. And so he takes the promise. He goes after Tiamat. He catches her in a large net. He drives an evil wind down her throat. It extends her stomach into a a, a very large stomach. He shoots an arrow that bursts open her stomach and pierces her heart, and he kills her. He then splits her skull with a club that he has in his possession. He scatters her blood out across uh, every which way in every direction and then stretches out her corpse full length And from it creates everything that you and I see. Now, that's quite a story. And you might be tempted to think, well, that has no relevance to you and to me, but I want you to notice a few of the elements inherent in this particular creation narrative. In this myth, creation is an act of violence. Marduk murders and then dismembers Tiamat. And from her dead body, he creates the world that you and I see every day. So what this myth actually teaches is that order is established by means of disorder. And that chaos, symbolized by the dragon of Tiamat, is prior to order, represented by Marduk, high god of Babylon. He comes in through violence and brings order and peace to the realm of the gods and therefore all of creation. In this story, evil precedes good. The gods themselves are violent and they use violence to bring about order. Now, if you read this myth or you know this myth and you were to, as the Israelites were, come to Genesis 1 and listen in on the way the creation of the world is explained from Genesis's vantage point, you'll notice a whole lot of things that are very diametrically the opposite of that particular creation myth. The Bible portrays a good God who creates a good creation. It doesn't talk about a God who is upset by something. It doesn't talk about a God who's um, plotting some evil scheme to kill someone with them then having rage on, on him for having already murdered someone. None of that is present in the story. Chaos, the spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep, the darkness, the emptiness, the void, the unformed parts and uninhabited parts of the creation, the chaos does not resist order. Good is actually prior to evil. And neither evil nor violence is a part of the actual creation. But it enters later on as the result of the first couple's sin and the uh, the sneaking um, workings of the serpent in Genesis 3. A basically good reality is then therefore corrupted by free decisions reached by human beings. Now, Genesis 1 paints actually a far more complex and subtle explanation of the origin of all things, the origins of man, the origins of the creation, the origins of things like the oceans and the land, and so on. Violence in the book of Genesis emerges for the first time as a problem requiring solution, not as the solution itself like in the Babylonian creation myth. 
In the Babylonian myth, though, violence is actually not a problem at all. It's just a fact. There was violence, which was the death from Marduk to Tiamat, which actually made the world. And in Genesis, it's quite the opposite. So, in this Babylonian myth, which, fascinatingly enough, is simply called the Enuma Elish, and you can look this up online, it's um, E-N-U-M-A is the first word, Enuma Elish, E-L-I-S-H. You can Google Enuma Elish PDF, and you can get the story, it's about eight or nine pages on a PDF, and you can read it for yourself. Some translations of it are very poetic. It was... um, quite the <laughs> quite the narrative and this isn't something that I'm making up um, I certainly would would never do that to you especially those of you that are interested in learning about how this actually works but in the Babylonian myth the creation of all things including mankind stems directly from violence our origin is violence killing is in our genes It's a part of who we are. It's a part of who the gods are. Therefore, it's a part of who we are. And so, according to this myth, human beings are actually thought of by nature as incapable of peaceful coexistence with other people. Order must be continually opposed upon us from on high. Men over women. Masters over slaves. Priests over the laity, aristocrats over the peasants, rulers over the people. Unquestioning obedience is the highest virtue and order is the highest religious value. According to the Babylonian myth, we were not created to subdue the earth and have dominion over it as God's vice regents or as God's stewards, as God's image bearers. Rather, we exist to serve as slaves of the gods and of their earthly stewards, i.e. kings or rulers. You see this most clearly, I guess, in the biblical story, probably at the time of the exodus from Egypt, where Moses is sent in to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. And Pharaoh, who sees himself as a God wants to know what other kind of God is claiming his authority to rule over an enslaved people and telling him that he needs to let said people go free. You see, the Egyptians would have bought into, although they would have explained it somewhat differently, they bought into the very same mentality as this Babylonian myth, and that is that the only ones made in the image of God, the only ones who could claim godlike status in the midst of all the people were the big dogs, the rulers, the kings. The common people were there to serve the king's benefit, not, not for the kings to serve the people. And so the tasks of humanity are to till the soil, to produce foods for sacrifice to the gods, represented by the king and by the priests that are up above the people, and to build the sacred city Babylon and to fight, and if necessary, die in the king's wars. The wars that the king decides the people need to go to battle for, for the king's agenda, for the king's advancement, for the king's fame. And the people do so thinking that they are honoring the gods when they honor the king. And so according to this myth, this Babylonian myth, violence saves. War brings peace and might makes right. Now, I could stop right there, and if you are tracking with me at all, some of what you've heard me say might resonate with things that you hear today on the news being promoted in various countries today that also believe that violence saves, war brings peace, and might makes right. I had a conversation just today here um, when this is being recorded. We are in a particular spot where we're being threatened with a potential hurricane. 
and we don't know if anything is going to happen, but whether or not it does, what well, one thing we do know is that there are particular dams that will <laughs> be hopeful to hold back the tremendous amount of rain that we're expecting to receive. And where we're particularly located, there are some very, very important people in high places in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina's capital, where if the floods become bad enough, the dams will be opened and released to empty the locations of high water, and it will be caused to spill in directions where I live. And the reason that's done is because in the places where the bigger and higher ups live, it's more important and more expedient to keep them safe and dry than it is to keep other people in smaller, less significant towns safe and dry. Hence, my town of Washington, which has about 10,000 people. Now, I'm not necessarily losing sleep over that. I'm not necessarily saying I'm upset about that. But what I'm noticing is that might makes right. It is the right decision to save those who are higher up than it is to save those who are lower and of less significance. This is a very current mindset in our world today, in our country today. These beliefs, this myth that violence saves, that war brings peace, that might makes right, that chaos needs to be brought, you know, order needs to be brought to chaos at whatever cost. These kinds of themes that surface directly from the idea that Marduk killing Tiamat and making the world from her rotting body, these ideas, believe it or not, are rooted in the Enuma Elish. They are rooted in the Babylonian myth that violence saves War brings peace and might makes right. Now, in our world, this belief is held to almost without question. Violence simply appears to be the nature of things. I mean, it's what works. It seems inevitable. It's, you know, it's the first resort in conflicts. It seems like it's the last resort in conflicts. It doesn't necessarily matter. And it has been named the myth of redemptive violence. And it is the story of the victory of order over chaos by means of violence. So it's the ideology, if you will, of conquest. The gods favor those who conquer, who are strong, who are victorious. And therefore, whoever conquers or who is strong or who is victorious must have the favor of the gods. Any form of order is preferable to chaos, according to this myth. So therefore, peace through war. Well, we don't think war is necessarily a great thing, killing people and going to to battle, but because of the sake of peace, we will fight a war which will bring peace. And so it is basically any form of order is preferable to chaos. And so even though war is ugly, it is not as ugly as what could have otherwise been there. Therefore, peace comes through war. That is a belief system. Security comes through strength. These are the core convictions that arise from the ancient historical Babylonian myth. And so these ideas at work, I think, could actually be seen really clearly in even our modern forms of entertainment. And I won't take the time to go down this rabbit trail, nor am I intending to pick on things particularly. I just think it's helpful when you and I can picture what it is that I'm talking about in a way that pretty much everybody around can understand. And so let me use a famous movie that I think accurately portrays this idea for you and for me. And it's, it's the movie Jaws. In this movie, if you remember the original, not Jaws 2, 3, 4, whatever, the original movie, police chief Brody is out on the ship. His shipmates have already died. One has been eaten by Jaws, who's just this enormous, ridiculously enormous, right? Um, Rage-filled, um, dragon of chaos in, in a sort of way, if you will. Kind of a Tiamat figure who resides in the oceans, these mysteriously dark, creepy places. It, it is wreaking havoc on this island of supposed fun and adventure and threats are being given to shut down the island, stop people from swimming in the beaches. And it's this, this fight of, of order versus chaos and good versus evil. But in the story itself, if you remember how it happens, 
Police Chief Brody, out of a ma major point of desperation, kicks an oxygen tank into Jaws' mouth. And the Jaws shark is trying to gnaw on the tank, and he looks really ferocious. And at the last second, Police Chief Brody takes a rifle, aims it as clearly as he can, and he shoots inside the shark's mouth into the oxygen tank, which then expands and explodes Jaws into a thousand pieces. Now, the image is just powerful. It rouses all kinds of, oh, we, we get to breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, that, that shark is clearly dead. Look at all of the, the pieces that are scattered, chunks of flesh dropping into the ocean. It's actually quite disgusting. But I want you to remember back to a few minutes ago when I explained the Enuma Elish, what you have was Marduk who drives an evil wind into Tiamat, expanding her stomach from the inside and then he shoots an arrow into her stomach, which goes through, basically bursts open her stomach and pierces her heart and kills her. Well, fascinatingly enough, the way Jaws comes to an end, the victory that is brought about through the Jaws movie, the, the order that is brought about through the chaos of the shark is actually the Enuma Elish all over again. A, an evil wind driven into the mouth of the beast, into the stomach, extending the stomach. That's nothing else than the oxygen tank that is sent in. The arrow that flies into the stomach and explodes Tiamat from the inside. Yes, that is in fact the rifle that shoots the oxygen tank. And what happens when that oxygen bursts forth from the tank? It is a giant wind, which quite literally explodes Jaws into a million pieces. And the end of the movie is, is found with moms and dads and men and women and boys and girls frolicking in the water once again peace has been restored through an act of violence and we like these kinds of things because we see it in the world and we actually believe that these are ways that god chooses to bring order or that god would be pleased to lead us in acts of violence and sometimes it sounds hard to think about it in terms of violent violence like i'm going to kill someone or i'm going to explode someone but i came across an, uh, an amazing book maybe six months ago called metaphors we live by and in the very first chapter it talks about metaphors as being ways of comparing two dissimilar things, but using the comparisons between the two to help us understand something. And one of the very first analogies that they gave, um, he says in, in, on page five of this book, the essence of metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another. And in this very first chapter, his his metaphor that we use every day to describe life is argument as war. And we talk about having an argument, if you will, a discussion, a disagreement, which you and I tend to think of as a negative thing in its entirety. I got into an argument with my spouse. I got into an argument with my, I had to break up an argument with my sons. And a few of the examples that this author uses to describe it are when we say things like your claims are indefensible or he attacked every weak point in my argument or his criticisms were right on target, I demolished his argument. I've never won an argument with him. You disagree? Okay, shoot. If you use that strategy, he will wipe you out. He shot down all of my arguments. This is just commonplace for us in the way that we talk. And what I find that's most fascinating about this is that if we were to go to a different culture where reasonable, rational disagreement of opinion could take place, uh, hopefully it could take place in our own culture, but if we watched two people sit across from one another at a table in a coffee shop and have a discussion about something where they were bringing counterpoints and they were offering rebuttals to something that their that their friend had had spoken up you might say well i don't know what it is that they're doing in there but what they're doing certainly isn't called an argument because an argument clearly has to involve 
rising blood pressures and veins popping out of the sides of one's neck and quite a few, you know, quite a bit of yelling and some, some getting frustrated and some wanting to pull your hair out or wanting to push the person. Argument is war is so embedded into our culture that it is actually a rare person who can have an argument and remain calm, remain disconnected emotionally from what feels like sabotage to prevent one from attacking, actually attacking verbally and emotionally and maybe even physically the person with whom he disagrees. And what I found most amazing about that is the idea that this whole thing is I can bring order to this situation by means of violence. And what we choose to do quite often is even when we feel that we are right in a particular position, let's even say in something that we think we are right about when it comes to God, How many times are we tempted and actually fall victim to the Babylonian myth in that the way to bring about our rightness, the way to bring about order, the way to ensure that peace comes in this relationship where there is disagreement, the way I am going to convince you that I am right and you are wrong is through yelling, getting upset, unfriending you, telling you off, giving you the silent treatment, whatever. Argument is war. Violence brings order. War brings peace. These are belief systems that particularly when applied to God oftentimes give people the right and the authority in their own minds to then go out and treat other people in the ways that they think God treats them. And so this idea, this idea is so deeply rooted in who we are as people that it actually causes us to put the brakes on. Who is God really? How does he create really? And when man comes along and messes it up, How does God respond? Is our God one who believes restoring order and peace to a fallen world is best done through violence? That is a question that every person must ask and every person is going to have to face directly when Jesus comes onto the scene. It is one of the biggest reasons, I think, why those who looked for a conquering Messiah to be all that they thought he would be and missed him when he came, I think one of the main reasons they've done so is because subtly they have bought into a mixture of the Babylonian creation myth and the one that Genesis paints. And they actually thought that the way God was going to bring about his end time order and the restoration of peace for the nation of Israel was going to be to violently overthrow Rome and everything that Rome stood for. And when Rome itself took out its violence on the one Israel thought was their king, the idea was not, did we misunderstand things? Their idea was, I guess Jesus wasn't the Messiah because their belief that violence brings order, violence is what makes things work in the real world, war is what brings about peace, domination is what brings about security, strength is what brings about victory. They had no category at all for the person of Jesus. And I would like to submit to you that the reason they didn't is because Genesis 1 and the Babylonian creation myth are so much more the opposite than what most people actually think. And along the way, as we continue to do more of these podcasts and unfold the biblical story, I'd like to point out to you time after time after time after time, particularly in the Old Testament, where the people of God are tempted over and over and over to appoint leaders 
to be their kings, to be their rulers, to be their priests, who do nothing but act exactly according to the Babylonian creation myth in the way they rule, in the way they create, and in the way they attempt to establish order and peace. It's a sad story, but it's our story. It's humanity's story in his attempt to figure out what it means to rule the world well. And next time, we're going to take a look at just that concept. So, see you next week.